Good evening, everyone. Thankful <coughs> for you being a part of our evening Bible study this Sunday, and uh, thankful for those of you that were out this morning coming, being a part of our worship this morning. We're so blessed to have so many different options and so many different opportunities to come together, and um, certainly glad that we have that capability. Certainly hope that you're taking advantage of those things. Uh, the more I thought about it, we said something this morning about it, and I just hope that you understand that, that we're not coming from a position of, of um, trying to make you feel bad for having other things going on with work and, and upcoming school and decisions and all that. But man, uh, the Lord has blessed us with a really incredible opportunity in the midst of this pretty troublesome situation. Uh, we've got some great opportunities to be at home. We've got some great opportunities to open our Bibles. Got some great opportunities to sit down with our children, maybe grandchildren in some cases, and and talk to to them about what's the most important thing they're ever going to do in their life. I mean, I just pray that we're not missing those opportunities and we're not taking that for granted. Um, thinking about perhaps this this will be posted in a, a little bit uh, right before, pretty much right before the the five o'clock Zoom for the little kids and. Thinking of that and thinking about how great an opportunity that is for our young kids to tune in. Alan does a fantastic job. He and Larry have done phenomenal jobs with those uh, with those Zoom Bible time Zooms on Sunday night. Just such a blessing uh, to kind of sit on the fringe and listen to those guys uh, spend time and teach our young kids. Man, what an what an awesome awesome thing that is. And I just hope that's something that you're taking advantage of as a family. Uh, totally understood. And understand even now, you know, we put 68, I think 68 or 70 devos out so far since the quarantine started. Uh, we've shot one of those a day pretty much for the last uh, however long, four months almost. And uh, with the exception of Wednesday nights and Saturday nights, there's something posted every night uh, video wise that you can check out. And uh, the, the, the Zooms on Wednesday night are, are just an awesome opportunity for us to get together and, and study God's Word together. And I know that there's a lot of you that maybe you're working or you got different challenges. But man, if you're home and it's 630 on Wednesday night, everybody's got the capability on their smartphone or their computer to join that Zoom. And I, and I just hope that that's something that sticks in your mind that you, you need to do. You need to be a part of that. And you need to, to be studying God's Word with us. So I just want to encourage you. I'm not. This is not a. You know, we don't we we don't like our numbers. It has nothing to do with numbers. It has more to do with we care about the spiritual health of our congregation and our our local people here. And man, we just want to encourage you to to grow in this time. This is hopefully a time we're never going to see again. But there's also some positives that have come out of this. Some crazy crazy positives. People coming to know Christ, people putting on Christ in baptism because they finally have had a chance to slow down and visualize and see what really matters. So just want to take a few minutes here at the very beginning of our study just to encourage you, man, and just just push you families especially. Uh, don't, don't forfeit this incredible opportunity that you've been granted and given uh, for the sake of something that truthfully is not gonna it's not gonna last and it's not gonna matter in the long run. So uh, if I could encourage you, I, I just I hope that I can. I hope that I can encourage you. Please know, anytime you have a question about something, you it's an easy reach. Uh, you, you text me, you call me, you email me. And if there's something you want to talk about, certainly that opportunity is there. Please don't, please don't lose this great opportunity uh, to come to know Jesus better, to come to know His God's Word better, to come to know your church family better. Please don't forfeit that opportunity. Uh, that we've been given. So with all of that being said, we didn't get a chance really to finish our thought this morning uh, because of the weather kind of acting up like it was. But uh, I know that you sort of got the major points of what we're talking about, but I want to look at two examples. One is sort of something we wanted to touch on this morning, which didn't have time for. And then uh, our, th our topic tonight, as you heard in the preview that was posted uh, Friday, uh, our, our lesson, our theme for tonight, just briefly, is going to be from Revelation chapter 7. But before you go to Revelation 7, just by way of reminder, in James chapter 2 today, we talked about this concept of partiality. And again, we didn't get to go into depth as, long, as far as I wanted to, and that's okay. That's perfectly acceptable and understandable due to a, the circumstances and situations we were 
we were under. But in James chapter 2, James talks about a topic, we mentioned this this morning, that, that really, truthfully, I don't know that many people want to talk about. It's just not a comfortable subject to talk about partiality and because that usually ends up going into discussions about prejudice and discussions about racism and sexism and chauvinism and all these isms that, that truthfully are, are holding our society down and keeping our society from, from growing. And truthfully, the only thing that's going to relieve that pressure is the knowledge of Jesus Christ and God's Word because that's where you're going to find equality. You want to read about what equality really is, read your Bible. Uh, Jesus treated everybody equally. He treated the religious elite just like he treated the the beggar on the street. It was, it was nothing. Di- it was nothing new for Jesus to reach his hand out across the table and touch a sinner. Whereas some might have looked at that and thought, "Man, uh, what a loser! What a guy that you know this guy, this guy eats." I mean, they said it multiple times. This guy eats and drinks with sinners, and Jesus took that almost as a compliment. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why I'm here. In Luke chapter nineteen. He said. Uh, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, of course, he's going to sit at the table with a sinner then. And so when you start talking about partiality, a lot of people get really uncomfortable because they think it's going to be some sort of um, soapbox sermon about uh, gender equality or racial equality or things of that nature. The truth of the matter is equality is equality across the board. And you read your Bible and you're going to find how Jesus treated people, how God intended for us to treat each other, and you're going to find equality. That's where it is. That's where it is. And then when James covers it, he covers it that way, just very matter-of-fact, very direct. And that is, look, the bottom line is, if you don't understand that that partiality is a sin, then you are missing out on something that's going to keep you out of heaven. I mean, that should get my, you want to get my attention, talk to me about things that are going to keep me out of heaven, or things that are going to send me directly to hell when I die. You want to get my attention, man, let's, let's talk serious. And here you have James saying, verse 9 of James chapter 2, if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And you are convicted by the law as transgressors. And we know that you can't be actively participating in sin and expect God to allow you into heaven. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So if I'm showing partiality, and I know we don't use that word a lot. We wanted to cover that this morning, just didn't have time, but People hide behind the fact that we don't use that word, and it frustrates me to no end. You know, partiality is just sort of a word that kind of goes in one ear and out the other because it's an old, it's a, it's a Bible word. We don't really use that in our common everyday vocabulary. So, Scott, it's really, I mean, come on, man, that's the old school something. No, no I'm gonna tell you right now, it is real. It's alive. It's happening right now in your workplace. It's happening in your schools. It's happening in your churches. It's happening in your churches. If you don't think it's happening in your churches, you have your head in the sand. If you don't think it's happening in your schools, you are ignoring the obvious in front of you. If you don't think it's happening in the workplace, you are absolutely out of your mind. This idea of partiality is alive and well in the United States of America, in Alabama, in Rogersville, and in our church family probably perhaps. We've got to call it like it is. Uh, The guy that I coached with for many, many years used to always say, look, let's get all the problems out on the table. That way we can deal with them. We know what it is and we can deal with it. When you go to your doctor and you're sick and you tell your doctor, these are my symptoms, this is what I got going on, that doctor doesn't go, well, you know what? I'm just going to take a random guess and I'm just going to hope I'm right. If he does, he shouldn't be your doctor, all right? He usually gonna, he's going to run some tests or he's going to do some this, that, or the other, maybe take an x-ray if it's some pain you got going on. And he's going to come back and he's going to say, based on my educated understanding, this is what's going on with you. And for me, I always like that because I always feel like, okay, let's just get it all on the table. If there's something wrong, let's get it on the table right now. And you tell me what we've got to do to get better. Okay? You tell me what I've got to do. Tell me what step one is. And then we'll worry about step two after we get step one. Okay, well, here's the deal. Let's get this all out on the table. If you don't think partiality exists in the church, you're outside your mind. you got your head in the sand. You think... You're comfortable, so that means everybody's comfortable. That is that is totally not true. That's why we asked the question this morning. When people leave our gatherings, when people leave being with us, this the, the this congregation of the Lord's people that meets at Rogersville or any other congregation. I mean, if you're watching this and you're not a member of the church at Rogersville, you're a member of the church somewhere else, this is totally uh, applicable to you too. At your congregation, when people leave your congregation, how do they feel? 
Because I can't imagine, I, I, and I've done this to people, and it, may, it hurts me to know that. I've done this to people where they've left, and I feel like, you know what? There was a reason I didn't talk to them. I don't like that guy. I don't like her. I didn't like the way they talked to so-and-so. And so you know what? I didn't even speak to them. And, and it hurts me to know that those people probably got in their cars that night and thought, you know what? I thought that was going to be a friendly church, man. That guy that got up there and preached, man, he didn't even shake my hand. He didn't say hello to me. He didn't He didn't even act like he wanted me there. As a matter of fact, he acted like he couldn't wait for me to leave. I must not be worth as much as the guys that go there all the time. I mean, it just hurts to think that I've done that to people. But I know I have. I know I've heard people say, look, and we're all guilty of this. Let's just, again, let's get all the part, let's get it all out on the table. Let's just go ahead and deal with it. I know I've been guilty of somebody says they go to a particular congregation of the Lord's people and I go, ooh, mm. that's a shame, you know? I ought to be ashamed of myself. They go to such and such church. Mm. Yeah, well, you know what that church is all about. I mean, who am I? What gives me the right? The one that drives me crazy and which I have committed and it drives me absolutely up the wall is when I've never been there and I don't know anybody from there except maybe one person and I make a, a rash judgment about the entire congregation based on one person and my dealings with that one person. That's absolutely foolishness. So I've shown partiality and I'm sure that if you really, really take this seriously, you have too. And it bothers me to know that I've done that and maybe people have left our congregation, a meeting of our people, and they have walked away from that and felt worth less. Or as I mentioned this morning, perhaps even worse than that, they've just felt worthless overall. It's heartbreaking to think about, it's painful to think about, but it has happened. And we have to own it, we have to admit it, we have to, to deal with it. I'm going to tell you what stepped on my toes is, and I want you to take your Bible right now and go to Acts chapter 10. This should be a fairly familiar passage to you, Acts chapter 10. This begins in verse 34. And Peter's had a little bit of trouble with a vision that happened to him, and God's kind of put him in his place. God said, don't call anything that I've made clean unclean. And Peter finally kind of gets the message, and he shows up, and he goes to do some teaching there in Caesarea and Cornelius you know, kind of falls all over him, and Peter says, wait a minute, you know, this is, I'm, I'm just a man, you know. I don't deserve any special preferential treatment. I'm just a man. And then when Peter stands up to preach to these Gentiles, listen to what he says. This begins in verse 34, Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Okay, pause just for a minute. Let me ask this question that seems very obvious, but unfortunately Scott doesn't listen a lot of times. If God doesn't show any partiality, then how can Scott show partiality to anybody? Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? That's like this thing that I've used for forever. That, that's like saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. It doesn't make any sense. That's foolishness. It doesn't matter if I bang my fist on the table and scream and holler and raise my voice and make a big show. 2 plus 2 is never going to be 5, ever. This just makes perfect sense. If God doesn't show partiality, then what gives me the right? What, what makes me think that I can? If Peter stopped there, it would be a good enough lesson and stomp all over my toes anyway. But he goes on and he makes his point even further. Verse 35, But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Okay, Scott, that means that you don't get to play judge, jury, and executioner when people want to come to church. Scott, that means that you can't sit on the sidelines when somebody says they want to become a Christian. You say, mm, I don't know about them. I don't think they're going to make it. Mm, how dare I? Now, remember who he's talking to. He's talking to some Gentiles here. Some people who've been told for a long time that they didn't belong. Been told for a long time that you know what, you guys can you guys can think about God all you want to, but the bottom line is you're never, ever going to be accepted. And here's what they hear from Peter. In every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He goes on, verse 36, As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, you yourselves know what happened 
throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day, made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people, to, just, to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and of the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter just lays it on the line. You're talking about getting all the problems out on the table so we can deal with them. That's what Peter's doing right here. He's just undressing all of this and says, look, here it is. Here's the problem. You've been told for a long time that you're unacceptable to God. You've been told for a long time that you're not worthy of God's love. I've got news for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and it wasn't just for the Jews. It was for everybody. Man, what a great message. What a great, powerful, powerful message. Isn't it interesting that what he does is he just kind of gives them sort of the brief history, and really, truthfully, the history is something that it didn't matter if you were Jew, Gentile, it didn't matter who you were, you could share in that history. If you remember, that's kind of the conversation that Jesus has with those two men walking on the road to Emmaus. They were they knew what was had happened, and Jesus says, "Look, you know, he's not revealing himself to him, to them yet." And he says, "What do you mean? What's happened?" And their their statement to him is. Are you the only person who doesn't know what's happened in the last few days? When Peter stands up and t preaches this message in Acts chapter 10, he says, look, you guys know the history. You know who Jesus was. You know when the message all started, and you know why it happened, and you know what happened to him. Physically, he was hung on a tree. He was buried, but he was raised by God three days later, and he appeared to us, and now here we are testifying about his appearance those of us who ate and drank with him, all of that message was something the Gentiles knew, but to them, they felt like, yeah, we know it, but we're not accepted. So really, what good is it? How would it make you feel to know that there are people out there right now? Right now, there are people right now, maybe even in your own family, who feel like they can't come to church with you, who feel like they can't sit in a church building with you, who feel like they can't worship God with you because they've been made to feel like they're unaccepted. They've been made to feel like God doesn't really care about them because you don't care about them. How does it make you feel to think and know, and perhaps even, I'm going to tell you right now, looking in the mirror, it's, it's difficult to hear, but it needs to be said. How many people have we known? How many people have we come in contact with? How many people have we tried to help that truthfully, we've made them feel so miserable and so terrible. We haven't empathized with them. We haven't sympathized with them. If anything, we villainized them. And how does it feel to know that those people walked away from the gospel message of Jesus Christ? Because they felt like they didn't add up. They felt like they didn't belong. They felt like because they didn't look like you, talk like you, come from the same family background, have the same amount of money as you, because of all that, they didn't, they didn't matter. I will tell you personally, that strikes me deep in my heart. You got your Bible, turn there to Revelation chapter 7. I want to make just a couple of quick points as we close this time of study together. I want you to be challenged. I don't. There's this fine line that, that that preachers have to walk. Just to be honest, if I can just be totally transparent with you, there's this fine line that sometimes what when what we mean as encouragement gets taken as chastising or uh, ranting or something of that nature. Please know that, that what I'm telling you right now has is not done in any sort of way to make you feel guilty or to make you feel uh, like you're worthless or anything like that. It's just something that we don't like to talk about because it makes us feel bad. So we need to acknowledge that and we need to deal with it. And that's why we're talking about it. It's always good to talk, not just hold stuff in. In Revelation chapter 7, I love this passage because I love the fact of what it tells me about eternity. Revelation chapter 7, this begins in verse 9. 
After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders, the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Listen to this now. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them, them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I emphasize, emphasize the words there and them, because if you notice, when John ex describes them, he says they're from every nation, from all tribes, people's languages. They're all wearing the same getup in this particular deal, clothed in white robes, verse 9 says, palm branches in their hands. But when this elder here, verse 13, one of the elders that addressed him, speaks about these people, you notice he doesn't say anything about their nationality. He doesn't say anything about their language. He doesn't say anything about what uh, tribe they're from or what people they're from. He refers to them as a collective, they and them and their. Man, I'm just going to tell you, here's the deal. When this life is over, those who are acceptable to God, those who have done what the Bible says you have to do to become a child of God, we're all going to go to heaven together. You're not going to stand in heaven and say, you know what, I don't like that guy over there. I don't like that woman over there. They went to this church when we were on earth, and I didn't like that church, and I didn't like that preacher, and I don't know why... You're not going to do any of that. I can tell you that right now. But I can promise you this. You continue down that path with that attitude and you won't have to worry about whether or not you like everybody in heaven. Because you won't be there. Now that's a wake-up call for me. I hope it's the same for you. All my concerns and worries and I'm angry at so-and-so and I'm mad at so-and-so and I don't like this person and I... This person was ugly to me once upon a time, and I told them I forgave them, but I hadn't let that. All that stuff, all that is is an anchor keeping you from where you need to be. It's just holding you down, holding you back. Be challenged by this right here in Revelation chapter 7. I want you to look at this, and I want you to pay attention to all the good that comes out of us being together. We serve a God who is willing, look at this now, He was. he's going to be their shelter, verse 15. He's going to provide them food and drink. They'll hunger no more. They'll thirst no more. The sun's not going to strike them. There's not going to be any scorching heat. He's going to be their shepherd, verse 17. He's going to guide them to springs of water, and he's going to wipe every tear away from their eyes. Man, that's the place you want to be, isn't it? I can guarantee you it's the place I want to be. And one of the things that I have to be really careful about, one of the things I have to be really cautious about is I can't be showing partiality. I know it's a word you don't necessarily use. How about this? You can't be bigoted. You can't be prejudiced. You can't be racist. You can't be sexist and expect to go to heaven. That's just the bottom line. If you're living that way, you need to change, and you need to change now before it's too late. Go before God, broken, understanding that He created you along with everyone else in His image. And for that reason, if for no other, but for that reason, you should respect and love your brother. You should respect and love your sister. You should love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus looked in the eyes of that lawyer in Luke chapter 10, and that man had some hate in his heart for, for the Samaritans especially. And Jesus said, which one of these was the neighbor? Which one of these three was the neighbor? And that man couldn't even stomach to say the Samaritan. He just said, the one who showed him mercy. 
You see, he was known in that story, the Samaritan's known for mercy, just like James chapter 2 and verse 13. Mercy triumphs judgment. Even in that day, in Luke chapter 10, it triumphed the judgment of this lawyer. But the problem was, Jesus said, I know that you haven't been doing that. You know how we know that he said that? Earlier in the same, in the same conversation, when he asked him, what, the, what does he understand to be the two, or what, what do you understand to be the, the law, how to inherit eternal life? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Apparently he wasn't doing something. By the end of the, the section, we know exactly what he wasn't doing because when Jesus says, who was the neighbor? He says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, correct. Now go and do likewise. That's the challenge for us. This weekend has been all about Luke 10. On Friday evening, that's what we talked about. Go and do likewise. Our sermon this morning, man, straight out of James 2. I mean, right in your face, right in my face. Don't show partiality. Don't fall into that trap the world tries to throw at you where you have to judge people and, and separate people and divide. Don't fall into that trap. And then tonight, man, we're all going to go home together. And if you're one of these people that has these, these hateful thoughts in your mind, man, you need to deal with that now, right now. You need to deal with that right now before it's too late. We all need to go and do likewise. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're challenged. I mean, it's been challenging to me, I'm going to tell you. Very challenging to me to consider, have I really loved my neighbor? Or have I just tolerated people and acted like I love them, but I'm not really fulfilling what God expects me to do? It's been a challenge, and I hope it's a challenge for you. We look forward to our studies, of course, each evening. Coming up this next week, Wednesday night, certainly, our Zoom at 6.30. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us for that and be a part of our devotional series. And, of course, we look forward to next Sunday morning at 8 a.m. in the parking lot. Hope you all have a wonderful evening.